Tina Tato, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's about our Keoki community, not at Kitihe to Kimihi, Ki Wakato Awa, Kim Wanga Totally Monga, Ki Tangata Titi, I hope. Uh, bad talking. Uh, kia ora everyone, my name is Brad. Um, tonight, as Sarah mentioned, I'll be going through a talk on what is socialism. Um, just a note to say that this talk is also available in written format um, in our latest uh, issue of the magazine, um, The Socialist. Um, so if you'd like to see it in a bit more finer detail, you can do that as well. So I want to start tonight um, by making a claim I've made previously, but I think um, I will repeat it because I think it's still true and I think it's still worth saying, which is that one thing that has become indelibly clear these past few months is liberalism's failure to respond to the crisis in Gaza. As Israel, as Israel rains unguided bombs and white phosphorus on Palestinian civilians, annihilates their hospitals and murders their children, the institutional response ranges from toothless disapproval to outright cheerleading. As the poet Tusiata Avia has written, Israel has the right to, do, to protect itself. Israel has the right 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 to protect itself. And Gaza does not. But no matter how strongly some factions, left-leaning parties, the United Nations may voice the opposition, they lack the means of realizing that opposition in material terms. Next to US pressure, the words carry little weight. The onslaught continues. The time is again ripe for asking, how can anyone go on to support a system so comfortable with suffering, so capable at producing it? The fishes are already starting to show. Millions of people in the streets, politicians sat, dissent in the White House, old lines of propaganda severed, new lines of solidarity weave together. As we withdraw from these wasted institutions, new opportunities, alliances, and ideas might suddenly seem viable. What might flourish in these cracks? Reactionaries will continue to blame those with the least power, while others will monopolize their trust in a feeble parliament. But neither approach addresses to Putake the root of the problem. <laughs> Unsurprisingly. Here's a key starting point for socialism. Politics cannot be isolated from economics. Any basis of authority requires the security of food, water, and shelter. Any serious authority requires the control of the materials, distribution, and labor behind those resources. Everything else, such as military power, comes second. No army can exist without a meal. In other words, whoever controls the flow of these assets has conclusive leverage over everyone else. School and school teacher, baker and bakery, politician and parliament. Under capitalism, property is held in the private hands of a few, resulting in the disposition, dispossession of the many. In these times of the climate crisis, we have seen a mere handful of fossil fuel tycoons alter the entire course of humanity. Our comparative lack of sovereignty, so recognized power of the ability to govern over others, is astounding. Restoring justice to the powerless, then, would require everyone to have equal access to the essential conditions for life. The fight against colonialism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and ecocide cannot exist or cannot be won without transforming this imbalance. The socialist demand to seize the, seize the means of production isn't simply a directive to wheelbarrow your boss into an open pit mine. It's an appeal for self-determination. Capitalism's primary orientation is toward the accumulation of profit rather than the satisfaction of human need. The fallout of this design is catastrophic, even for itself. Acceleration is the enemy of stability. And ravaging the natural world, the system undermines its own foundations. Oil refineries sink into the Louisiana coastline, which, by the way, is what this is. 
And this is oil refinery 66, Phillips 66, uh, in Louisiana, that has had to close down in previous years because the river that you can see beside it um, has flooded and burst its banks and destroyed the plant that caused the river to rise in the first place. So there's a cyclical, self-eating, almost absurd kind of part of it. Logging operations flee Australian bushfires, carpet and wool factories in Tetairafati, clothes plants indefinitely in the aftermath of Cyclone Gabriel. Likewise, neoliberal policies threaten funding for hospitals, schools, public transport and childcare, ripping away the necessary materials from the very people who keep the system going. Any system that strikes at its own supports falls inevitably into crisis, finds itself for collapse. We exist for the sake of capitalism that does not exist for the sake of us. The poor, the dispossessed, the unhoused are not its purpose. Onto the question of history. The question of economic and political power can also allow us to sweep away the old narratives of so-called socialist countries. Socialism is the collective ownership over the organs of production. The working class, including those unable to work, has direct control over how resources are acquired, processed, and distributed. Stalin's USSR and its descendants, China and Mao, Cuba and Castro, may have distributed wealth according to a planned economy, but the production methods remain thoroughly coercive. Bureaucrats requisition gain frame from, present, from peasants and, and profits from factory workers. Labour councils were disbanded and trade unions became arms of the state machine. This was not only a failure to be democratic, but to satisfy the main criterion for socialism. What's more, there is no such thing as socialism in one country. Marx and Engels were clear about this in the Communist Manifesto, ending with the resounding imperative, working people of all countries unite. Capitalism is international. So countries are bound in a vast web of trade routes and supply chains. The state alone suffocates. National borders were drawn up by the whims of empires cleaving cultures and terrain, so it makes no sense to adhere to these constructs. That is a process. That is a project of isolation, not liberation. This isn't an attempt to rewrite history either. Throughout the Russian Revolution and beyond, leftist critics invade against the sorry state. Others admitted to their departures. In 1921, Lenin, even though we use some of his writings, even him introduced a policy for state capitalism. Visiting some 14 years later, the US revolutionary Emma Goldman would write, there is no communism in the USSR. Not a single communist principle, not a single item of its teaching is being applied by the communist party there. Not a socialism's vision. Sometimes when socialists invoke the workers, certain images spring to mind. White men with muscled arms, mallets and overalls, hands covered in dirt. This is a mystification. Today, a worker is most likely to be a poor woman of color. And that's just at the point of production. Long before anyone arrives at the workplace, thousands of hours of reproductive labor have brought them to that point. Children must be fed and raised before they're able to work, they must be educated when they're able and taken care of when they're not. All of this work rendered invisible keeps everything afloat. This, this is politics from below. Recognizing the conditions of work means standing in solidarity with the oppressed in every way that life is experienced. The raw mechanics of capital do not insulate language, culture, or the body from its violence. And so its opponent cannot be an isolated movement, but one that blooms new perspectives and voices. For example, the disability community could teach socialism how to reimagine the physical world. Liberalism is happy to give everybody rights, sometimes, but it has no mechanism for equally distributing means. We have a right, so-called, to three meals a day, but no guarantee to access them. Given we produce enough food for 10 billion people each year, there is no good reason for this. 
even those rights secured today might be discarded by the government of tomorrow, to one's indigenous sovereignty or language, for example. Justice cannot be voiced, it exists only in the end. Our theory of change. Capitalism is not an immoral system. That is, it does not operate according to a set of moral laws or dictums. Rather, it is amoral. The system functions only in the pursuit of profit according to economic principles. This is a small change in words, but a big change in philosophy. Capital cannot be confronted by lifestyle changes or ethical consumption. It does not respond to appeal to a higher authority. And it's the same in our relationships. How we take care of each other can't be limited to just listening, bringing each other food, providing comfort, definitely those things, but also organizing in ways that, are, that our lives can be sustained meaningfully. Care is as much an arm around someone's shoulder as it is one that holds a picket sign. And nor should Parliament have the right to absorb all of our political attention. Not when it has surrendered so many critical areas of power to banks, media companies, and investors. And especially not when it so openly disregards the will of the people. The millions of marchers in Palestine have charged public opinion, but not the government supposed to serve them. Most Americans, for example, around 60%, support a ceasefire, yet the White House continues continues to overrule them. It does not really deserve the name of democracy. In the breach between people and their politicians, new movements are being formed. Movements that will push crucial ideas into the mainstream about the imperial wrath on brown bodies and the complicity of our institutions. This is how the needle shifts. Socialists, feminists, environmentalists, queer activists and indigenous peoples moving arm in arm through the streets, heading towards a radical dreaming. Thank you.